On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program Osha Gray-Davidson. He is the author of Clean Break, the story of Germany's energy transformation and what Americans can learn for, from it. And he is also the uh, publisher of thephoenixsun.com. Welcome to the program, Osha. Thanks very much, Sam. Glad to be here. All right, so let's, let's start with um, the, the story of Germany's um, transformation. In, in 2000, now we're talking 12 years ago, uh, 6% of Germany's energy came from renewable sources. What, what has happened since then? Well, what's happened is today they're at 26%. So they went from 6 to 26% renewables in just 12 years, which is more than what their target was. They've been ahead of their target all the way, and now so much so that in 2020 they were supposed to be, they planned on being at 30%, and now they've moved that up to 35%. So they're well on their way. Okay, and so this started essentially with, uh, well, I don't know if it started with a piece of, of legislation, but that was the, um, I guess, the, uh, the, 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 the catalyst for this transformation in Germany. Well, there's a number of ways you can look at it, and that's certainly one, because if you look at the legislative history, you go back to 2000, and that's when the Renewable Energy Act was passed. But if you look a bit deeper into what, created that, what caused that to happen, it was a citizens' movement that started, and even that you can go back further, but 1986, after Chernobyl, there was a movement of people in small villages all throughout Germany and in cities of people who didn't want the risk anymore of nuclear power, because after Chernobyl, when radioactivity fell across Germany, uh, people just didn't want to deal with it. They, they realized it was too big of a risk for them. And people just started putting up renewable power themselves. And uh, there were a number of battles, and I chronicle some of that in the book. But what eventually happened is politicians gave the people what they wanted, which was a phase-out of nuclear power eventually and a uh, program of feed-in tariffs, a way of supporting renewable energy. And that's really made a huge difference. Yeah, explain to us, what, what, what are feed-in tariffs? Okay, so without getting into too many details here, um, essentially, uh, although they've been called subsidies, they're not, uh, they're not paid for by the government. What happens is, if you want to put solar panels on your roof, you just do. You put solar panels on your roof, and then whatever year, you do it this year, say, and you will be guaranteed for the next 20 years a price above market, the market price now uh, in payment for every watt that you produce, that you send onto the grid. So that's good for 20 years, which gave the business community and everybody, since everybody can now become a utility in Germany, that gave them the stability that they needed to be able to figure out if this is cost-effective. And by doing that, they made sure that everybody had skin in the game. And that kind of uh, enticement worked to the point where now 65% of all renewable energy in Germany is generated by individuals, co-ops, or small groups of investors. And, and how do they provide that? I mean, uh, I mean how do they provide that, um, that, uh, that price point? Or, or, I mean, who, who... Right, where do they get the money? Yeah. Yeah, it's paid by ratepayers, and it comes... On their utility bill, it's spread throughout Germany, regular rate payers pay a certain amount to make this transition to renewable energy every year. And it has had broad support throughout Germany for a number of years. One problem with it, and there, there are a lot of problems to this transition. It's not an easy thing to do, but they're doing it. Um, one problem is that certain groups are exempted from paying that tax, which means or not tax, that, that amount. So other people, normal rate payers and small businesses, have to pay even more. And that's where it, it becomes a contentious issue now because so many um, high-energy, high-electricity users, uh, large corporations, large manufacturers, don't have to pay anything into this renewable energy um, uh, 
payment plan, and they're getting the, another benefit from it because the amount of renewables that have entered into the grid, the electricity that's entered into the grid, has pushed down the price of the wholesale price of electricity uh, by about 18%. And and now is that uh, the 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 pushing down of the price of of electricity that is that savings uh, does that in some way offset that fee that the the sort of uh, normal consumer pays in some re- well, respects it, or no? It, yeah, it it certainly does to some extent, um, but this is a long term project, and one thing that people fail to take into account it's very different when you build a um, a nuclear plant or a coal-generated uh, electricity plant. Uh, when you do that, you once you paid back that initial investment, you still have to pay for fuel forever, and that price is going up for coal, for um, for natural gas in Germany in particular. It's gone down in the U.S. But with renewables, there's no cost involved for the actual source, the renewable energy source. It's wind. It's uh, solar, sunshine, it's hydropower. So it gets, it's going to become cheaper and cheaper. Also, that, that uh, subsidy, or sorry, here I am calling it a subsidy now, but that uh, renewable energy surcharge that's put on a bill, that goes down. The amount that you receive every year for putting um, solar on your roof or whatever, that amount goes down every year which does two things. It gets people to invest as soon as possible in putting up solar panels or Mm -hmm. joining together with friends to invest in a wind farm. And it also eventually, it it lowers the price of the electricity. And and, and it goes down, but it goes down in a predictable, we know exactly what it's going to be in 2015. We know it's going to be in 2017, et cetera. There's certainly a lot more, there's more certainty involved when you're dealing with renewables because you don't have the source of the energy, you don't have that price going up. Whereas with coal, with oil, with natural gas, there's really no way to know exactly what's going to happen, and that's why we've had oil shocks um, in the past. Um, as resources dwindle, it gets more expensive expensive to get them out of the ground. Um, and that doesn't take into account any of the health effects or climate change effects of using the traditional sources of fuel, fossil fuels where there aren't any of those effects, obviously, with wind and solar. Now, the uh, Renewable Energy Act, um, it calls for 80% renewable power by 2050, uh, 2050 in Germany. Do, do they seem like they're on their goal? I mean, I would imagine at one point it becomes each percentage point in which you are um, increasing the amount of renewable energy comes a little bit less easy, and or at one point it becomes harder to make right. that transition. W- w- give me a sense of of what the of what that trajectory looks like. Well, right now they're still beating their trajectory of what they had planned. But you're right that once you get past say forty percent, it's going to get a lot tougher. Uh, for one thing, you're going to need storage to be able to store the electricity generated by renewables that you don't need at this point. But once you get up to 40%, uh, engineers in Germany have said that that's when they'll really need to have uh, storage. And there are other solutions to it, too, and Germany's pursuing them, of having a European-wide grid, where, or like they do in Scandinavia, where the, um, the grid itself is, it crosses national boundaries uh, with 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 ease and and so Germany has to work on that and that's that's a big that's a tall order but uh, the Germans I talk to most of them are pretty certain that they can do this in part because they were told when they first wanted to do the make this renewable energy transition the uh, a lot of people in Germany's uh, engineers there said no you can't you can't do that because after you get past four percent the grid won't be able to handle it. Well, now they're at 26% and they're handling it. So they feel confident that they can continue to meet the challenges and stay on target to meet that goal. What is and some it? actually believe they can, they can do better than the 80%. 
What what is it about at forty percent? Uh, once you get there, that you need to start to store it is because the amount of energy that's being put out there is not the uh, being used in the moment at that point. Exactly, that's my understanding of it. That at forty percent, you've got such a significant portion of the grid dependent on it that you there are times that you're producing more electricity than is being used. And right now, that that has happened. Um, a couple of a few days this past summer that they actually had more renewable energy than they knew what to do with so they had to sell it at a loss in some cases i believe or certainly for very cheap utilities had to sell their excess capacity to other countries because they didn't have an efficient way of just storing it for later essentially right it's it's a, batteries are expensive they do have some really innovative ideas that they're pursuing, as well as cheaper batteries in Germany, like uh, gravity-fed systems, where you, you use excess power during the day to pump water uphill to large holding ponds or lakes. And then when you need it more later, you can have it come down and power uh, turbines. Mm. So there are a number of possibilities of what to do, but uh, they're pursuing all of these. And you know, they, they've done what was considered impossible already. Whether they'll be able to continue to do that uh, certainly looks like they'll be able to, but that's, it's not assured and it's not easy. But um, they're, they're, they're certainly doing a much better job than we are. So, I mean, aside from the political uh, question, which I want to get to in terms of, you know, any, if there are any lessons there for the United States and but but in terms of the way that that energy is delivered, the it, it seems that the uh, the primary difference was having I guess um, energy sort of like a distributed system where 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 you have just a bunch of individual a- energy producers as opposed to who who could rather than just sort of roll back their own usage on their meter could actually, in some ways, perhaps profit from it. Absolutely. And a lot of the people I've, I talked to, the experts in Germany, I spent three weeks traveling there, seeing projects and interviewing people, and a lot of them made that point that, um, that the key to the energy revolution, or the German word for it is Energiewende, the key to that is having decentralized distributed power, and that's key for a number of reasons, and one is that you have the benefits accruing across the board to people, and so you, you, it, it pushes an entrepreneurial um, uh, plan, so people can take advantage of this, they want it, they, they, can, uh, they can benefit from it. It's not just a feel-good program of having a utility put up solar panels, and you know that, okay, so some slight difference in climate um, in greenhouse gas emissions are being made. People also actually make money doing this in Germany because the benefits are widespread, and that's, that's entirely due to having a feed-in tariff where you allow everybody to become a utility instead of having a monopoly of just a few. All right, so let's extrapolate these things uh, to the United States uh, for a moment. Okay, so the obviously the... The it seems to me the biggest um, obstacle from I mean because from a from a physics standpoint there it, it doesn't appear that there is anything uh, in uh, about the nature of Germany as you know uh, physically that w- would the, we would have to change much to bring this program to the United States. I mean, is there a, maybe more density? I don't know. What 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 is there any difference in terms of like the actual physicality? Yeah, I, right. I get what you're saying and you, uh, there are there are differences, but they can be met according to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the government laboratory that deals with renewable power in the United States. They produced a study that found that by the year 2050 the U.S. can get, there's no physical reason why we can't, can get 80% of our power from renewables. And what do you know? That's exactly what Germany's plan is. So it would, they found that it would work here. And that doesn't mean that there aren't obstacles. And some of them are the same as Germany faced, and some of them are different. But, yeah, it, it, it can be done physically, according to them. 
Is there, I mean, what would be the, what would be some of the physical obstacles that we would face that uh, Germany didn't? I mean, I would imagine um, if we look at it as a distributed system, it would be, it, I mean, that would mitigate a lot of the sort of the physical issues, yes? And, and I imagine, I mean, Germany has no more uh, or less sun than I would, I would imagine the average place in the United States. I mean, I think they, they have the amount of sun that is it, they're, they have, they're, Alaska. Yeah, Alaska. I mean, so, um, what, what type of physical impediments would we be subject to that the Germans, uh, weren't? I can't speak to that, um, with any expertise. I can tell you what I know of it is what I, what I've heard mostly is just that the distances involved are so large and that with a giant city, it's, it's very difficult to get enough renewable power to power it. Um, there are more people living in rural areas and small towns in Germany. So the U.S. would, would face more problems with that, uh, also with building a, a grid, which we need to do anyway because ours is old and decrepit. Right. Um, but that, that's a lot... Again, that gets back to capital costs. None of this is really a physical hurdle. All of them get back to the amount of money that needs to be spent and the political will to do it. And that's where there's the difference between the United States and Germany. They're willing to pay for it, and there's political will to do it. And let's talk about the political opposition to it, because I would imagine that Germany did not have the sort of institutional opposition to uh, allowing individual Germans to have more control over their energy production than we see in this country, because we have huge uh, fossil fuel interests, huge coal interests, huge uh, nuclear interests. Um, it's, it seems to me that, that it's that type of obstacle which Germany didn't face in the same way that we did. But maybe I'm wrong. You tell me. Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I got mixed answers on that. Uh, some of the experts I talked to in Germany said, well, look, we face the same problems that you did. Um, we had an enormous nuclear complex here of, of industry. Uh, and, and that certainly is true. Um, but in Germany, very early, people started getting on board with this, in part because uh, it grew out of opposition to nuclear power that was so strong in Germany, that people wanted to end nuclear power, and the anti-nuke people in Germany looked around and said, you know, we can't just say no. People can't just say no to things. We have to find a way of saying yes to something. Can't get rid of nuclear power. You have to do something else. And they realized that renewable power will be able to have, uh, is a way to close down I'm sorry, that renewable power is a way to close down nuclear power. That's aside from all the other benefits of climate change and income that's now spread out through small towns and everything in Germany. So um, that, that's one, just one thing. How, how big was uh, nuclear power uh, in Germany at that time when that movement started? I mean, in other words, how much uh, did Germany uh, get its, uh, w was it powered by, by nukes? I might be wrong in this, but I think it was about 30% at, at that time. Um, and now it's down, the, uh, I think it's 18%, something like that, that they've lowered it. So it, it was a significant share, and they did face um, opposition. I did talk to other people who said they believe that the whole difference between the United States and Germany, almost all of it, can be attributed to what you're talking about the political influence in the United States of the opponents. Also, you have to remember that they have a different system of government there with a, it's a parliamentary system. So that allows smaller groups of people, it's a multi-party system. To, it's harder to capture politicians in Germany than in the United States with uh, campaign contributions by large corporations. So that, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, of substance in that, but uh, I I really don't know which. Um, maybe there's probably truth in, in both of those interpretations of what the reason is that we haven't been able to do it here. Politically speaking, were there any particular parties that um, 
in that mix that uh, were key. I mean, uh, the Greens big in, um, in in pushing that legislation and, and building the coalitions necessary. I'm just curious from a, absolutely, from, uh, yeah, tell absolutely. Us about it was the uh, called the uh, the Green Red Coalition, the Green Party, and the Social Democrat, and uh, they formed a coalition government and were in charge of the government for several years in the early 2000s. Uh, but it's interesting. That, it, that was one of the things that, that I learned a lot about while I was there and before I left, that the, the party system is, is different there. I mean, the CDU, which is the center-right leading coalition partner in Germany that Angela Merkel is the head of, and she's the chancellor of Germany, they're... If she were in the U.S., she would probably be a uh, – on the political spectrum, she'd probably fall in the moderate Republican uh, side, of which we have almost none in the United States I was going to say, so the Democratic Party. The right wing of the Democratic Party. (laughs) Yes, that's probably a a good way to to see it. Um, Now, she has not implemented the Energiewende – as efficiently as the earlier party coalition, ruling coalition, did. And a lot of the problems that have cropped up, some people in Germany, experts, say, well, that's because you have people who aren't 100% behind this who are the governing coalition. And so that, I think that is a, a big factor. And so the, 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 it will require the same degree of uh, political will throughout the process. So, so I mean, w- with the lessons that you have learned from uh, studying how this happened in Germany, what are some of the keys for this to happen in the United States? Because it seems to me the, the big issue is how do, you, how do you get to a point where we, we have the ability – Particularly, I would imagine in, in there are certain areas where uh, where it's 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 far more efficient and uh, far more crucial to have decentralized little essentially uh, power uh, I don't know power stations power uh, plants if you will and by that I mean you know maybe a couple of panels for a neighborhood or something. Well, it's interesting. The Institute for Local Self Reliance. In, uh, in Minnesota, did a study a few years ago that found that I think it was every state but maybe three or four could, be, um, could use this distributed model to get all of their electricity. It would, they'd use different technologies in different areas, obviously. In Iowa, they already get, I don't know, a third, something like that, of their electricity from wind power. And down here in Arizona, where I live, uh, we could be getting a, a huge amount from solar, and we're not really taking advantage of it, although the growth has been quite exceptional here in, in Arizona in the past year or so. Um, but that model can mostly work throughout the United States, but the key is, and I, I think this is the main factor that you're looking for and talking about, is that in Germany, it started from the bottom up. They didn't wait for politicians to do this Renewable Energy Act. It was politicians reacting to groups and individuals throughout the country who were demanding that they have the switch. They didn't want to live in fear of nuclear power anymore. They also didn't want to pay the, uh, they didn't like the monopoly status that the nuclear power plants had and the coal plants. So I think for it to happen in the United States, we, we can talk about politicians being bought out. And, you know, I brought that up myself. But at really the, the crucial point is there has to be citizens' movement, and thankfully there already is. There are people around the country who are uh, building renewables, who are creating programs, and it, it's difficult to do. Um, but there are, there are feed-in tariffs that are, have some of the same qualities uh, and are somewhat different. So it is starting in the United States. It isn't reported on adequately, I don't think. But it, we're, you know, a decade or more behind where Germany was. And there's a lot that could be done through legislation. 
at the state and the federal level um, to make this transition. But you know, do we are we willing to do that? Are are people willing to do this? I mean, it seems that we uh, unfortunately don't have that sort of the that inciting event of or Chernobyl because the to the extent that um, we are sort of slowly the 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 I mean, on one hand, when you're talking about burning fossil fuels, it is a a a less immediate, or at least it appears to be a less immediate threat to our health and safety than the idea of radioactive uh, radioactivity showering upon us, I, I would imagine, on some level. Yeah, uh, that, that's certainly true, and I would hope we wouldn't need something like that to happen here mm. um, to get us to change. But th- we already um, we have climate change uh, re- that's increasing the sea level here, leading to flooding, uh, drought. I mean, there, there are tremendous costs already. Uh, people have done a, um, opponents of renewable energy have done a pretty good job of, of saying that there is no uh, problem with climate change. We, we also have 13,000 people a year die in the United States right. prematurely from breathing pollutants from coal-fired electrical plants, which is just I guess, assume that we, that's just an acceptable price. Um, but we don't need that. And I think that there's a growing consensus now with climate change after Sandy and some other things and the, the organizing around the Keystone XL pipeline from Canada for the shale oil that, no, we're, we, this is a big, big threat. Climate change is a huge threat, and we need to find an alternative. And we do have those alternatives and it's a matter of implementing programs that will allow people to take advantage of them. You mentioned that um, that uh, there's been not very good reporting on uh, what's been happening in terms of distributed power in this country. Um, what, if there was one or two things that we should take a look at that uh, my audience who wants to uh, dig into this further would want to take a look at, what would you recommend? I would actually recommend going to look at people who are experts in that area. I'm researching it now for a possible second book, looking at it, but there are people who've been doing that all along, and the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, they have a website. John Farrell is their uh, research director, I believe, and they have a number of studies, as does, um, you can look at Paul Geip, G-I-P-E, online. Uh, He's done some studies. He's a wind proponent in particular. Uh, And following the the publisher for for my book that sent me to Germany is Inside Climate News. And they're online, and they, they do a good job of reporting on these things. So I'd recommend those. Great. Well, the uh, the book is Clean Break. It is available for uh, it's a buck on uh, Amazon. Uh, That's right. It is the story of Germany's energy transformation and what Americans can learn from it. OSHA Gray Davidson, thanks so much for joining us.